So the next uh, topic is on Mossbauer spectroscopy. Okay. So again, I, I tried to make the first three slides kind of similar to what I expect you guys to have for your presentations. So I'm going to time myself on this one and we'll see, see how I do. The last one was a little bit over time. We'll see, we'll see about this one. Um, so this technique is called Mossbauer spectroscopy. Um, it's essentially you have a source uh, that's radioactive. So you have a cobalt source that's a isotope, a radioactive isotope of cobalt. And when it decays, it decays into uh, an isotope of iron that is at a higher energy level. And when then, when that higher energy level of iron uh, relaxes and then that's gamma radiation at a specific wavelength. And if any iron is present in your sample of the same isotope, which is isotope 57, it will absorb that gamma ray radiation or it will resonate with it and absorb that gamma ray radiation. Now, ideally, if, if your sample is exactly the same chemical composition uh, or environment as the iron from the source, it would absorb all of that gamma ray uh, radiation. But typically your samples are not, not the same chemical environment, so it will transmit that radiation. Uh, but we want to be able to change the energy of this gamma ray emission to see you know, how the iron in your sample is different from the source. And it can ch we change that energy through the Doppler effect so we're, we essentially, we take our source and we move it back and forth. And so in the positive velocity, we get a blue shift where the energy increases. Negative velocity, we get a red shift and energy decreases. And then when we plot the transmission versus energy, uh, so x-axis is the energy shift uh, labeled as velocity, and then we measure the transmission. So like I said, if your sample is exactly the same as the source, so the iron in the source, which would be, for example, uh, alpha iron, just uh, metallic iron, then you should get an uh, absorbance peak right at zero because it's, uh, it's absorbing the same wavelength of energy. Okay, um, so an example of using this uh, method uh, comes from a paper, and I'm kind of self-advertising here. This is my own paper that I recently published. Uh, this paper looks at how the synthesis of uh, this material iron hexacyanoferrate is affected by pH and this uh, organic molecule called EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. And this molecule is a collating agent. And collating agent means that it will bind to the iron in solution in multiple uh, ways. Uh, so essentially, this uh, synthesis um, I'm controlling the pH, which will control the chelation strength of EDTA to the iron, and that will affect the morphology and also the chemistry of the sample, which will in turn affect the, the electrochemical performance of it as a sodium ion battery. Uh, so what I really I want to look for is the number of vacancies of this iron cyanide precursor that are in my samples at different pH. Uh, so Reg typically, you know, in that last example I just gave, we looked at the number of vacancies through a chemical analysis. We looked at ICP, comparing the ratio of, uh, you know, lead to iron, for example. But in this case, we have two chemical species that are both iron, so that you can't, can't do any chemical analysis to show you which iron is missing, right? So this is where IC, or excuse me, this is where Mossbauer has an advantage, is that this iron is chemically different than this other iron. So this iron is is uh, coordinated to six carbons of the cyanide, where this other iron is coordinated to six nitrogens of the cyanide, and that changes the chemistry of that iron. All right, uh, so uh, the Mossbauer results, uh, you, you have these data points, which is the absorption peak of uh, my sample compared to the source, and you fit these different, uh, these, these different uh, peaks that represent each chemical uh, species of iron in the sample. So in this case, I have two chemical species of iron and uh, the area above this curve is correlates with the concentration of that species of iron in my sample. So what I did is I took the area of each of these curves and I compared the ratio and that would tell me uh, the ratio of this iron coordinated to carbon, which is actually low spin iron compared to this iron, which is high spin iron. So between my two samples that were made at different pH, I can uh, look at 
the ratio between those two irons, and that would tell me uh, the number of vacancies in my material. And then from that, I was able to de derive a chemical equation for uh, that material. So you see the, the, the material that was synthesized at a lower pH had more vacancies than the material that was synthesized at a higher pH. And the reasoning behind that is that the at higher pH, the collation strength of the EDTA is greater, which uh, slows down the reaction. And if you have a slower reaction or slower nucleation, you allow more time for crystal growth. And if you have slower crystal growth, then it becomes a more perfect crystal with less vacancies. Okay, so that was uh, five minutes and 20 seconds. So still a little bit over time. Are there any questions? Are you guys confused about uh, Mossbauer? I have more slides, but it, uh, from just this brief uh, presentation, you guys have any questions about this spectroscopy is limited just to iron, all right? Uh, this type of, uh, this, uh, I forget what it's called, the, the Mossbauer absorption, I believe, is only in certain elements. Iron is one of them. There's another type of Mossbauer spectroscopy that uses a different element that you look for. I forget which element it was, but there's only like two elements you can look for, and it also depends on your source. So this is the most common source is the, the cobalt 57 decaying into iron 57. And what that also means is it, you can only detect iron 57 in your sample. And uh, I think iron 57 is only like 2% of natural iron. So, you know, there's not much in my sample to begin with. The, the, this data was collected over multiple days. And actually I did this at the, the physics department. Uh, there's a class for in the physics department that looks at different characterization techniques, kind of like our class, and one of them is Mossbauer spectroscopy. So this isn't even available for like, uh, you know, researchers. I, I emailed the teacher. I said, hey, can I, you know, pop my sample in for a week? And they said, sure, no, no problem. So it was kind of, I was kind of lucky in that, that respect. <clears throat> but yeah, good question. Yeah, just for iron in this case. Yeah, okay, there, indium, selenium, and tin, yeah. Yeah, so again, it depends on uh, the source you have. You have to have a radioactive source that will decay into the element that you're, you're looking for. I believe, I could, be, I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure they have different sources, but I don't know, you guys can double check for me. This, this absorbance is all iron 57. It does not absorb uh, whatever the most common uh, what is it? Isotrope is, is, isotope. I forget, I don't know, 56, 58, one of those. Yeah, only iron 57. So you can, you can purchase uh, precursors of uh, like iron salts that are enriched with iron 57 for different type of uh, uh, experiments dealing with the Mossbauer spectroscopy. But for my, for my experiment, if I wanted to increase like the intensity of my results, so maybe I could do it in a shorter amount of time, I would have to get both a uh, precursor of ferrocyanide that was enriched and also a precursor of iron chloride that was enriched. And I don't know if the enrichment would have been the same. Also, that's expensive too. So, but yeah, there are, I have seen different experiments where they use like a, an enriched source. Okay. So I'll move on. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about Mossbauer in detail and kind of explain these different parameters that you can, you can get from these curves. Um, so this is an explanation of the radiation, the radioactive source. So we start with a metallic cobalt 57, which is a radioactive, I forget its half-life, but every, every year or so the department has to replace the source because the intensity decays, right? The intensity, uh, as the cobalt turns into iron, it, it goes down. Um, and so it will undergo electron capture where inner core electron will be absorbed into the nucleus and that will turn a proton into a neutron and it also emits a neutrino, but we don't really care about the neutrino. Um, but what that results in is iron 57 in an excited state, okay? And so we, I have, uh, this is an energy diagram of the iron 57. So here's the cobalt 57 decaying, electron capture into iron 57, so it decreases its energy. Um, this might look similar to like the, elect the electron energy diagrams. But this, remember, this is the nuclear energy diagram. And when you have a, a excited state 
a nucleus of iron 57, it decays or it relaxes. It can emit different wavelengths of energy like gamma rays. But look at this, th look at this energy level, 122 kilo electron volts. That is a very high energy level, right? So much higher than what you would see of like x-rays from uh, characters like K beta x-rays, for example. Uh, so also when it decays, there can be other phenomenon. For example, you could, you could have uh, to fill that missing electron, you'll have uh, X characteristic X-rays. You could also have OJ, this is pronounced OJ electrons. These are, just, uh, sorry, OJ electrons. These are just uh, photoelectrons. So you just have an electron emission uh, from the decay of that electron energy. Um, but what, what you're looking for is this specific energy uh, relaxation from this energy state to, to this energy state of iron that emits this, what's called the Mossbauer line, that specific energy of gamma ray. And then your, your, your sample will resonate with that energy. But like I said, if your sample has a different chemical environment, then the resonant energy will be slightly different. So in this example here, I went from a velocity of negative three millimeters per second to three millimeters per second. That's my range of velocity of energy. And here I have a translation of one millimeter per second is this small of an energy. So, you know, out of 14.4 kilo electron volts, I'm only changing it by this much in order to see, you know, the difference. So, you know, the, the chemical environment does have an influence on the energy state of the nucleus, but it's very, very small, but it's, it's, it's big enough for us to actually measure it and see that there is a change in the energy state. That's kind of interesting. Um, okay, so here are some of the different parameters or uh, details you can get from the Mossbauer spectroscopy. One is called the isomer shift. So this is like the shift away from the, the source, uh, from the chemical, uh, the, the chemistry of the source, uh, how your chemistry of uh, your sample is a bit different. So it's given by this equation. I can't really explain the equation in much detail, but I believe you guys are familiar with this, uh, what is this, psi or phi? I think it's psi, yeah, P-S-I, psi. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So you guys should be familiar with this, uh, this uh, equation here. This is the wave function, because I think you, you learned it last quarter in your electronic properties class, the way you had maybe had to graph some wave functions or the, the, the electron density um, of different states. Anyways, so the wave function squared is the probability density of electrons and at zero is at the nucleus. So uh, the probability of electron at the nucleus will affect the energy shift of this absorption. Okay, so the ice, that means the isomer shift is, is dependent on the S character bonding. So the bonding of your iron atom to surrounding ligands will affect this isomer shift. So for example, uh, like I said, if you just have metallic iron, it should just be right in the middle with zero energy shift. But if you have iron ions like iron chloride or iron um, iron cyanide is my example, then you will expect an isomer shift because you're, ch you're changing the local environment. And then also uh, screening of the nucleus from P and D electrons. So that has to do with the, the valence state, right? So if you have metallic iron, you can ionize the iron to iron three plus. So you're removing uh, the S electrons and you have uh, less D electrons. All right, so that screens the S electrons and then you can have, an, that will give you a positive isomer shift. But if you have an iron two plus, uh, you have an even greater positive uh, isom isomer shift because you have more D electrons to shield the outer S electrons. Anyways, <clears throat> the other uh, characterization of this is electric quadrupole interaction. All right, this is, has to do with the shape, the symmetry of the ligand field around the central ion or electric field around the central ion, in this case iron. So it can come from the ligands that surround it or also the valence state. If the valence uh, or the electron configuration of its valence state is uh, uh, symmetric or not. So for example, these are, this is uh, the D orbitals of uh, iron three plus in the high spin configuration, the d orbitals of iron two plus in the low spin configuration. And both of these examples are symmetric. So if you had just had iron three plus that was symmetric, uh, high spin, it, it would not, it would have a, a VZZ of zero here. 
but then it would only depend on the ligand. So if this parameter is zero, you would not get a quadrupole splitting. You just get a single peak. But if this uh, VZZ is not zero, then you would expect to have two peaks instead of one. All right, so here's some more examples of the ligands that would affect it. So this is low spin iron two plus like here. So it's valence is symmetric. If it's surrounded by six cyanide ions, that's still a symmetric ligand field. So you still get a singlet instead of a, a, a split. But if you took the same iron two plus and you replace one of the cyanide ligands with a, a NO minus ligand, then your ligand field, electric field is no longer uh, symmetric that would give you a non-zero VZZ, and that would re result in a doublet peak. And then the same thing for the high spin case for iron three plus, surrounded by water, for example, it's symmetric. Replace one of those waters with a chlorine, it would not be symmetric, and it'd be a doublet. Although I should say, I don't think um, this mass power spectroscopy, you can do it on liquids. The reason is, in order for the, this mass power uh, resonance to work. It has to be uh, what's called a recoilless interaction. So when, when uh, for example, when this atom emits a, a uh, gamma ray, there's a, a recoil process, right? So uh, you're, you're, you're emitting energy, you're going to have a mass recoil. Uh, for gases and liquids, I believe that's the case, and you can't, that won't, won't work for when you want to absorb the same energy. But in solids, because of the solid crystal lattice, the recoil is essentially zero uh, because of the large mass of the lattice. Um, and in that, in that case, this mass power spectroscopy will, will work. So uh, I, for, I forgot when I was talking about this, because these are all like ions in solution, I guess you could say. But they could, they could be a solid. You could have this part of a solid uh, uh, so, um, material. Anyway, so those were two things, isomer shift, electric quadrupole interaction. So if I go back to the data, uh, I have these different parameters that I, I show for, from the Mossbauer results. So I have my isomer shift, my electric uh, quadrupole. Uh, gamma is, the, is the, the line width of this Lorentzian curve um, and so on. And so but what's really important is finding the area under the curve. That, and that would allow me to build a ratio of these two different irons. Okay, um, let's see, any other questions? I think that's all I have. It's been, uh, it's about an hour. So I, uh, I think I'll end it here.